Amy from Stonemaier Games, and I'm here as usual on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on the Stonemaier Games Facebook page to chat about Stonemaier Games news, what I'm working on here right now, what we're working on, and answer your questions and discuss some random topics that come up. Uh, today, it, it's a, a little eerie here in St. Louis because most of my team, uh, Dave, Alex, and Susanna, are based in St. Louis, but today they are all in Reno for the Gamma Trade Show, which is a... Uh, it's a convention of sorts that's geared towards retailers and distributors. So they are there to talk to retailers and distributors about Stillmeyer Games. And Joe, my other co-worker, happens to live in Reno, so it's very easy for Joe to attend Gamma. So it's just me in St. Louis right now, um, although as usual, it's just me on the live cast. Susanna sometimes pops in. I think sometimes Joe and Alex and, Susan and uh, Dave listen in. Uh, so that's happening in the greater Stillmeyer Games sphere. Also, before I forget, today I woke up to a nice, pleasant surprise. The uh, One of my favorite podcasts, the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, decided to feature me as their designer spotlight today. I had no idea they were doing that. Uh, they just It just kind of popped up in my, in my feed today. So if you're curious to hear their thoughts on me as a designer and a perhaps an entrepreneur, a businessman, um, check out the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast. That, uh, that episode, I believe, is live today. It's a little, I think it's a shorter episode than normal. Um, and it's just a little spotlight on me. So I thought that was pretty cool. Good morning, Tim, Ray, Tony, Nathan. I won't name everyone. His name is Nadir. Uh, Nadir here, is here live, it sounds like, for a, a rare occasion. Sean, George, Kyle. Um, thank you all for popping in to say hi. I really appreciate that. Um, I am recently, I've been working a lot on a specific game design, a game that takes a lot of work, kind of a lot of, not repeated tasks, but a lot of, uh, a lot of little things I have to do to, to keep this design updated. So I'm working on that. I'm also working on a, a, a co-design that we're going to do a little rough play test tomorrow. And uh, I have a, a chat today with someone who is submitting a game to us that, um, that's a kind of a special project. So I'm having a little chat with them today about that design. Before I forget, though, I want to mention my chocolate of the day. If you're ever in St. Louis, I highly recommend checking out Cacao Chocolate here in St. Louis. It's a very loud bag. But I'll show you my favorite is the milk chocolate with toasted Missouri pecans. I pick up this from the farmer's market whenever I go to the Tower Grove Farmer's Market on Saturdays here in St. Louis. But I highly recommend Cacao. It's really delicious chocolate, especially their milk chocolate. Like it's, I guess it's around probably around 40 to 45 percent. Let's see if it says on here. No, it doesn't say the exact percentage, but I'd estimate it's around 40 to 45 percent. So it's it's a fairly rich milk chocolate. Not too sweet, but still really delicious. Um, Sean asked, what's the best thing to happen to me in the last week? I love that question, Sean. That's a fun question. Um, what is the best thing to happen to me in the last week? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, uh, maybe a lot of little things. Like I made some good progress on a game that I'm working on. The secret cabal thing was a nice surprise. Um, I wouldn't say there's any big things. I got to play, uh, played earth on earth day this past weekend. Megan and I had a good rousing game of earth and she crushed me, but I had a lot of fun. So it was just a fun little thing to do over the weekend. Um, we also watched some star Wars movies over the weekend, which I always enjoy. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that anything really jumped out, but a series of good things. One bad thing, I did have a wicked migraine last night. Usually, um, my, my evening routine is that Megan and I watch dinner. We take our time. Usually, we watch a show or two while we eat dinner. And then I work for another two and a two and a half hours. And that's my, my creative time, uh, usually at night, I, my, my design time often. Um, but I just had a headache that one of those headaches that were like, I couldn't even really eat because I was feeling sick all over. And so I essentially went to bed last night at seven, which I never do. Usually I fall asleep at 11. So I took a nap at seven. I woke up, I was still feeling terrible. So I went back to bed. Good news is I, it was a passing thing. I feel great now. Um, a little groggy from the extra sleep last night, but, uh, yeah, had a, had a brutal headache last night. Um, one thing I want to mention before I forget, I have I see George's question. I'll come back to that in a second, George. Yesterday, I received the Elemental Essentials box from Top Shelf Gamer. Here's what it looks like. I don't think no, everything won't spill. I can just show it to you. It's one of these uh, realistic resource boxes. Top Shelf Gamer actually bought this brand from us. We had this brand of realistic resources. They bought it from us a couple of years ago and have done wonderful things with it. And this is the first time that I've seen them produce an actual full collection of resources. So there's water and blood. There's these uh, metal electricity tokens that I have in here. There's uh, smoke. There's um, explosions, 
fire and ice down here. I really like the ice and the fire and the metal, um, the metal electricity. So really impressive product that they put together here. I really like what they did with this. They even did it like when we had our boxes like this, we didn't have this uh, magnetic opening and closing, but it makes it feel really, really special. They did a fantastic job with it and I wanted to mention it today. I just got my copy from Kickstarter and I think they'll at some point have it on sale or not on sale, but uh, available on their website. So check that out at Top Shelf Gamer if you're curious about that. They have a bunch of other collections there too. So uh, George says, have I seen season three of Star Trek? George, you know, the only Star Trek show that I've really gotten into, nothing against the other ones that just haven't haven't explored it. Uh, maybe you're talking about uh, the Picard season. I haven't watched Picard, but we've only watched uh, Strange New Worlds, I think is the series. And I think they're coming out with newer episodes this summer. So I'm really looking forward to that. But that's the only Star Wars series that I've ever really watched on an ongoing basis. But I'm open to suggestions. I, I know a, a while ago we had a talk about this in the live cast where people recommended specific episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, which people seem to really adore. And so I've slowly checked out some of those episodes and they are really, really good. Um, yeah. And I'm curious about Picard too. I might check out Picard at some point. Ray said that he visited Chicago this past weekend. He ate delicious Vietnamese food, Chicago style hot dogs, and tried some cherry chili chocolate. Cherry chili chocolate. Interesting. And topped it off by getting to learn wingspan from the people we stayed with. Oh, that's great, Ray, that you got to learn wingspan and from uh, from some friends as well. That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Zach says, which game required the most playtesting? So which game of ours that we make, Zach, that, that required the most playtesting? Hmm. I don't know, I can answer that about different games in different ways. So uh, Expeditions took the most waves of blind playtesting and the most local playtests here. Like I've probably playtested Expeditions more than any other, any other of our games, just because I went through so many different versions of it. Also Charterstone, Charterstone was a real commitment for the playtesters because they had to play through a whole campaign plus an additional game. So normally playtesters, Elite playtesters organize three playtest sessions per game for Charterstone. That was 13, 13 games per group. So that was a lot. Um, what else required a lot of playtesting? Those are the two that really jump out at me. Um, there have definitely been a few games that have taken more waves than we thought, um, but, but they, they worked out in the end. But those are the two, I would say, outliers almost among the group. Good morning, Rick. Thanks for popping in. Carlos says, he's been thinking about something related to Ark Nova, Dune Imperium, and Wingspan. He says, while I love that the first two games, while I love the first two games, I feel that it's weird that they don't do more to cycle the available cards you can get. There have been many games of Ark Nova where I've started with a strong hand to pursue a, a certain strategy only to find that by the end of the game, I didn't get a chance to draw any other card that could benefit that strategy. And in Dune, there are times that the card row stagnates because we are not very interested in what's it, what, what's available so not many new cards are drawn. The latest student expansion adds a token that each player can spend to refresh the whole row of cards, which seems to acknowledge that there might be a problem, but to me that token seems like a hack and not a solution. I wanted to check, oh, sorry, Facebook scrolled past it. I wanted to check, um, I wanted to check the perspective of other, other people and reading comments and forums. There's a group of people that think that the scar scarcity of cards that you get in a play is a good thing because it forces you to be flexible. I, that resonates with me too. Maybe not as a global answer, but that definitely resonates with me. But when I think about Wingspan, another game I love, I don't think that the many ways in which the card row is refreshed makes it more rigid than those games. What do you think about this topic? It's a good, it's a good question, Carlos. Um, so I would say the, the the slight counterpoint I have to giving when it when a game gives you ample opportunities to refresh a card row, I think the downside is that. Uh, there might be cards in that card, card row that other players are hoping to get. And if you're refreshing it too often, then it can be frustrating for players who see a card who see a card that they want and they're waiting to get it or hoping to get it. Or maybe they can't quite get it this turn, but they want to get it next turn. Um, so I think that can be the frustration point if you are offering too many opportunities to refresh. So I see your point about the token in Dune Imperium, but I actually like limited opportunities for card refreshes rather than um, frequent opportunities for card refreshes in general. Uh, I also think, I wonder if more games should offer this option. That option is, it's a bit of a, almost a house rule style option, but if they said it in the rules, it would be more open to players to use. But if the rule book said, if all players agree that they don't want any of the cards in the card row, then you could just refresh it. 
I've done that certainly a few times in games where we're like, where we have noticed the card row stagnate and there isn't an official way to do that. And I'm, I'm almost glad for the other reason I stated that there isn't an official way to do it too often. And I've said to the table, hey, does anyone want these cards out here? And if everyone says no, we just refresh it all. I think that is a, 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 way, to, a way to do it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a limited issue that can be solved with a house rule if you're open to that. But you're right, I, I, I wouldn't mind for games to offer, honestly, something a little bit more like the Dune option, where you have a few opportunities to refresh that card row, but that it doesn't happen too often to the point that it disrupts people's strategies or the cards that they're, they're specifically building around or going after. That's my thought. I am curious about what other people think about that as well in the comments here. Um, I have another question of the day, but we'll, we'll start with that one because I think that's a good question. George says he's really enjoying season three of Picard. He says high ratings on IMDb. Um, he says they made season three like a reset. Interesting. He said episode, epi uh, I'm sorry, Facebook keep scrolling ahead here. Um, first two seasons had six. So George, are you saying that I should just watch season three of Picard and that's it and leave it at that? I'm open to doing that for sure. I'm also open to watching the whole, uh, the whole series. Tom says, did I see that Wrexham got promoted to the uh, English Premier League? I did. I did. I was so excited to see that the, the other day. It happened a little bit earlier than I really, than I thought it could happen. But I guess going into the last game, they are already four points ahead. So they're guaranteed to um, to make it over Knotts. And Knotts County might still make it as well if they make it make their way through the tournament. But yeah, I was really excited to see that. Mihai says, how can I do blind play tests for a prototype if I don't have anyone in the area to turn to? You know, you do, uh, that's a good question. You, uh, it, it is helpful for, well, we do need lead play testers to have at least one other person to play test with. Um, however, there is also solo play testing. So you can reach out to some of the more well-known potentially solo designers or publishers that publish solo versions of games and say that you are available for solo play testing. Um, that is, a, that's a viable way. We have our, our Automa Factory team, they always taste, test our games for solo. So that's one way to do it. You can just test solo. Good morning, Stephen and Dusty. Dusty, okay, Dusty, I was waiting for to see if you'd show up because I have some news for you. Dusty had an idea. I believe this is Dusty's idea. He had an idea recently for me to film a time capsule video of my cabinet of secrets. So I have a cabinet of a bunch of different prototyping stuff from various games that some of them won't even release for another two or three years. And Dusty had the idea that I film a video of me talking through everything that's in that cabinet and uh, that after I've released all those games, that I can release the video. I can go back in the past, find that video, and release it in the future. And Dusty, I'm happy to say that yesterday I filmed that video. It was a little weird. It was a little surreal to talk about things that I won't actually showcase for a long time. But, uh, but yeah, the video now exists, and I look forward to remembering that it exists after a certain game is released, certain couple, couple games are released in the future. I know a few are going to be released this year or next year, um, but there are a few that are much more distant in the future. So after they are released, I will release that video. It'll be a neat moment, I think, to look back and go back to that video. So thank you for that idea. It was fun to film yesterday. Uh, okay, Sean, I think he's talking about my, my card refresh solution. He says, the only problem with asking... That is if someone wants it and doesn't want everyone doesn't want everyone else to know. That's true. But uh, yeah, that, that, that is fair. That is fair. That uh, You could ask that question and people don't want to make it clear that there is actually a card out there that they want. Aramis is here from San Francisco. He's visiting Japan for the first time in two weeks with her husband. It's our one year wedding anniversary and we're staying in Tokyo for four nights and Kyoto for three nights. Kyoto, that's... That's, that's my place. That's where I studied abroad for an acad academic year. He says, I recall you spending some time in Japan when studying abroad in, ch in college. Any recommendations on things to do, eat, drink in both Tokyo and Kyoto? I have been to Tokyo, but it only, only a few times and only for brief stays. So I don't have any specific food recommendations there. In Kyoto, you know, I don't know the names of many of the places where I ate, but um, there's a gyoza place, a pot sticker place that is near... Uh, the third bridge in, uh, so th there's a river that runs north to south through Kyoto. And there is a little gyoza place that's kind of near the third bridge on that river. Um, 
there's there's like a Starbucks near that bridge. And if you go south near there, there's a great gyoza place. But this is 20 years ago. I have no idea if this gyoza place still exists. Uh, Kyoto is just a beautiful city to walk around and try a lot of random things. There's good street food there. Um, some, some good touristy things to do, of course, like the Golden Pavilion is there. There are also just, there are temples everywhere in Kyoto. So if you walk down the street, you will see great food, you'll see great modern things, and you'll also see great temples that not all of them I think you need to go into. Some of them are just worth looking at and walking past. Um, I don't remember all the names. It's been so long that I don't remember all the names of the various temples. But there's, there's one that has um, aqueducts that's a little bit less, not as well known as the other ones. And it's a really, really beautiful temple to visit, this aqueduct temple. I believe it is on the east side of the river. Um, there's also, uh, what is it? Kiyomizu Dera, I believe, is a temple that's also on the east side of the river. There's, uh, yeah, I, there, there's so many beautiful temples to visit in Kyoto. I don't think you need to necessarily target one of them. But I'd recommend just walking around a lot. It's a beautiful walking city. It's also a good biking city if you're able to uh, rent a bike and just bike around because the sidewalks are really, really wide and are um, bike friendly. Uh, and the food. Yeah, I mean, I, I have all these little specific places that I enjoy going to. Oh, uh, there's some great ramen in Kyoto. Uh, there's Tonuru. Tonuru is in the north uh, east side of, uh, of, to of Kyoto. Uh, that's Tonuru. And there's Ipudo, which is a little bit more of a chain. You might be able to find that in some other places. That is in the a little bit more in the southwest corner of, of uh, Kyoto. So that's Tondu and Ipudo. Again, this is from 20 years ago. I don't know if any of this stuff is still open. Hopefully it is, though, because that ramen is really, really delicious. I hope you have a wonderful time. That sounds like an amazing trip. I'm, I'm a little jealous, and I need to go back to Kyoto and uh, see if any of these places are still open. Chasey Meeple says, How do you feel about recommended starter levels in board games? Do you think you can turn off experienced gamers? Starter level. So, yeah, I've experienced this recently with Earth. Um, and Earth, like, highly recommends that you start with a certain mode that's a little bit simpler than the... It, it's the goal system is a little bit simpler in the starter mode. You know, I, 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 as a more experienced gamer, I don't consider it a turnoff, for sure. I, I like that the option is there, and I can choose not to use that option. Especially if it's very simple and easy to remember, like the backside of a board. I think if you keep it simple like that, it's great. Front side of the board, back side of the board. Oftentimes, I think games do this with like a, a default board uh, player mat where everyone has the same player mat, and on the back side is a more advanced asymmetric mat. Or even in Pendulum, we have player mats where the the front is simpler, the back is more complex. So, I think that's a that's another way to do it. Even though both sides are asymmetric, so I think if you keep it simple, I think it is it, it it's great. If you uh, add a lot of complexity to it, and therefore it, it actually makes it more complicated to remember like which version is the starting or not starting um or if you can't adjust it by player like in earth earth it is goals for all players so if you have one player who knows the game really well and one player who's just starting out it can maybe feel a little frustrating for the player who knows it well who has to only work with those those more basic goals that's why i like it on the on the more personal side arc nova does this really well arc nova has basic player mats and they have advanced asymmetrical player mat. So a newer player can play with the basic side of the player mat while in the same game that advanced players are playing with the more advanced side of sides. I really like that that version of it. So George confirmed that we could just watch season three of Picard. Um, and and that's, that's good enough. All right, George, I, I might do that. Thank you for that recommendation. My question of the day today was about, uh, so a topic, where did I hear this topic? I think I heard it from Gay Barrett at uh, the Board Game Design Lab, and I, I've talked about it in different ways with a few other people since then. The idea of an unfair advantage. What is your unfair advantage? An example of this would be an athlete who is really tall, or a person who is really tall might have a slightly better advantage in a game of basketball or a game of volleyball, a sport where it helps you to be tall. Um, that's a very simplified example. but. The idea of the question of what is your unfair advantage and how do you use that to your advantage um, in, in life, professionally, personally? I'm thinking about it more in terms of business with Stonemaier Games. What is, what is an unfair advantage that we have? Um, not focusing so much on the unfair portion of it. It isn't about positioning ourselves in a way that is above anyone else, but just looking at any advantage that we have and leveraging it to bring more joy to people, basically. 
And so I've been thinking about that topic recently and how that uh, how that can work with uh, with people and businesses and how I can write about it in a way that might be useful to other people. So if you have any thoughts about that topic and how I can write about it in a way that maybe adds value to you, uh, feel free to let me know in the comments here. Daniel says, so I think we're talking about the uh, the previous question about uh, card rows and, and refreshing uh, public displays of cards and games. Daniel says he likes a voting-like approach. Everyone places a token near the card row asynchronously when they aren't interested in any of the cards. Okay, so at any time in the game, you can just put a token out and say, this is a time, like, I want to show all the players that I'm not interested in these cards. Um, when all the players have placed the token, then we refresh the row and the number of tokens can be limited. I think that works well, Daniel, and that, that respects... Card, uh, play what players want or don't want. Um, you know, there's also a way, playing off what I think George said a few minutes ago, maybe this was somebody else, but if there is a card that you want, but you don't want to show other players that you want it, if there's a card row where the slots for the cards are numbered, you could have, this could take a lot of components, but you could have a way to secretly place a little tile face down that says that you, or maybe a dial or a tile that says that you really want card number one, but that's the only card that you want. And so you're okay with the card row refreshing except for that card, um, almost maybe reserving that card if you decide to refresh the cards. That's probably getting too complicated though. I already don't like the idea, <laughs> that specific idea. Peter says, which game components in, in a Stomeyer game are you the most proud of? Well, Peter, I'd say we put a, a component in almost every game and every expansion that that uh, that I'm proud of. So it's hard to narrow it down. I have done actually a whole video about this topic, like what are my favorite components in Stomeyer games? And actually just yesterday, I filmed a video about component innovative and inspiring components that Stomeyer ambassadors highlighted that they really enjoy. I'll talk about maybe the most recent one, Expeditions, our newest game. I really like the size of the mechs. It's the first time we've done really, really big mechs in a game. And I like the metal mechs too. We've done metal mechs before, but I like the feel of metal mechs in the ironclad version. Uh, what else in Exped Expeditions? A lot, of, a lot of other little smaller components that are less dramatic than that. There's a removable tray that helps with setup. There are the meeple tokens that are all unique. So they're different colors and different shapes for each color. So they're dual coded for color blindness and thematics. Um, I like the bag. I like I like reaching into, into a bag and grabbing a bunch of tokens. So I like that in, that in Expeditions where you have that with the uh, the uh, corruption tokens. We also have that in Libertalia with a different component, the Bakelite tokens. They feel really good. Slightly less environmentally friendly, but still good to dig through. If there's any specific game that you're thinking of, Peter, I can definitely name my favorite game, a game component in that game as well. Julie's chiming in about the refresh option. She says, uh, Meeple Land. She says, from what I can recall in playing it with family last winter, you can get in a situation where nearly none of the concessions or amusement park rides are ones that anyone needs because they are duplicates or not oriented well for player board. Duplicates don't help you in scoring, so you're pretty much paying the cost of the tile to refresh that one spot. Uh, this reminded before I read the rest of Julie's comment, it reminds me a little bit of Ticket to Ride, where they have, uh, if a certain number of the same card shows up, I believe it's just the, the wild card, the locomotive, then you have to refresh the card row. Julie says, my parents, this is back to the game Meeple Land. My parents house rule that you cycle one tile from each row out each round, which is a common way to refresh some tiles or cards in other games. I'm not one to house rule things typically, but if you experience the same frustration frequently, I can see doing it. When you know the refresh is coming, that, that's a good point. So the, the refresh is not uh, happening at a player steered time or player uh, control time. It's happening at the end of each round. So you know it's going to happen and you know it's coming up. That gives players agency to decide, do I want to grab this card now? Knowing that this card is going to go away very near, very soon in the future. Uh, Julie says, when you know the refresh is coming, you can plan around that still if there does happen to be a tile that you want. It only happens a few times, much like the bird card tray refresh in Wingspan. Yeah, I, I, I think that works well in Wingspan. You know it's coming up, uh, and so you can plan around it if you really want a card in there. Jake has some card market, card market refresh ideas as well. He says, significant card market rotation can lead to rote strat strategic paths as players have a high enough certainty at the beginning of the game that the cards they need will come out will. So Jake is saying that there's a downside to having too much refresh because if you, it doesn't give any, uh, it lets you choose the strategy and never deviate from it if you want, because you know you're going to see like all the lion cards that you need eventually if you wait long enough to see those cards. Um, 
so uh, he's saying the opposite of that is also maybe a little bit better there where if uh if the card row forces you into a more tactical approach, it makes you pivot more. It makes you not be able to do the same strategy every game. Jake continues to say, a more stagnant but still dynamic card row forces players to be more flexible in their strategy, trying out new cards every time, putting a greater premium on tactics over strategy. So I'm sure yeah, that's a great point, um, that there's a, a balance here in how often you let the card row refresh or the card market refre refresh impacts if the game is more tactical versus strategic. Lots of great thoughts on this. Ray has a thought too. He says, regarding card refreshing, I actually like the factor of card rows not refreshing regularly in those games. It can lead to players bending their intended strategies in unexpected ways. This is very similar to what Jake just said. And sometimes leads to better strategies than what I had initially expected. So I actually not like, I, I actually like not having the option to just automatically refresh card rows. We have in Wingspan Asia, we introduced a mechanism where if, uh, so generally in Wingspan Asia, when you play a bird, you uh, place a token on on the, the map and you get a little, sometimes you get a little bonus, sometimes you are claiming kind of a, a something that can help you with end of round scoring or end of game scoring. But every now and then you can't place a token or maybe you really don't want to place a token on one of those slots and there's a backup place where you can place that token and you can use that token to refresh, I believe it's either the bird feeder or the card tray. And so it's something that comes up very rarely in the game, but it is possible to do. And uh, you have to put a token there to actually do it. And I think that works pretty well too. I think I've seen good feedback about it. Um, yeah. Lori is here. Uh, first time to catch me live. Greetings from Estonia. One of my favorite disc golfers is from Estonia. Kristen Tatar, I believe is from Estonia. Um, Lori says, can't wait to play the and review expeditions. Here we finally have decent weather to enjoy, enjoy disc golf after nine months of winter. Pine forests are the best because there are no ticks. Yeah, we gotta watch out for those ticks in the winter. Same here in, in Missouri. Estonia is full of the dangerous ones. Same here, yeah. In fact, going back to disc golf, uh, uh, Ricky Wysocki, a, a famous disc golfer, got bit by a tick last winter, the beginning of last season, and he's still dealing with the effects of Lyme disease now, even though he's a very healthy guy, but um, Lyme disease is, is brutal. So I really feel for him. And I'm glad you're having some fun outdoors getting some disc golf in, Lori. That's awesome. Does Estonia have some beautiful courses? I'm kind of assuming they do because Kristen Tatar is so good. And uh, uh, I believe Tati is also from, from Estonia. So I'm, I'm hoping you have some beautiful courses there to play. William is here. Hey, William, good to hear from you. William says, regarding card root refreshes, I liked the mechanism that's in Blazon or other games where if you, or Bla Blazon, Blazon, I always mispronounce it, where if you don't like the card row, then you can draw from two cards from the deck, add one to your hand, and use the other to replace one card in the row. William, this is, yeah, this is the video, the mechanism I talked about in my video. I think it might actually be required that you do it. So basically, whenever you draw a card in Blazon, um, whenever you would draw a card, you draw, uh, yeah, I'm forgetting the standard now, but at, at the very least, you draw one card from the deck and then you choose from that card and all of the cards that are, that are in the card row. So it naturally gets the card row to refresh more often. And every time you draw a card, you get to see one extra card. So even if there's a card in the card row that you want, you always have to draw that one card, that one extra card um, to give you that option. You might see something even better that you want, or you might take the card out of the card row and replace it with the card that you just drew. That keeps the card row moving along at a very brisk pace. It's a really, really clever mechanism in that game. I really, really like it. I'm glad you highlighted it here. Dusty says his unfair advantage is finding a lot of joy in just playing a game versus winning. I like that, Dusty. I, I feel the same way about most games that I play. He says it's mostly just an advantage for me, but I guess it benefits my opponents and that I won't rage and flip the board. I like that. Nick says, you seem to really like Japanese culture. I, I do, absolutely. Um, have you ever considered making a board game with a theme in that genre? With Stillmeyer's revised policy after Stillmeyer, after Viticulture World, would you consider making a game like that in the future? So Nick is referring to a policy that I kind of instituted after Viticulture World where we are going to be very careful, very hesitant to make games that have real world people, real world places, or real world events. Um, one of the, uh, so I do love Japanese culture. I would love to create a game that is inspired by Japanese culture, but it would probably be, um, if I did it, it would probably lean into, it would probably have a speculative side to it, basically. Lean into Japanese mythology or something like that. Um, 
I think the thing that I want to be the most careful about are uh, real world people, having real world people in our games, just because, uh, I don't know, people are flawed. People, everyone's flawed in some way and some way worse than others. But uh, I don't know, you never, I made me realize that no matter the amount of uh, effort and intentionality we go into to put the right people in our games and to think about that and have cultural consulting and things like that, that we can still overlook some things that in hindsight seem very obvious. Like, of course, we shouldn't have put conquistadors in Viticulture World. Of course. Um, and I know that's a big one, but at the same time, we could put someone in Viticulture World who later on it comes out that they are also just a terrible person or were a terrible person. So that makes me really hesitant. So I'm open to putting uh, creating a game about Japanese culture, but I would, I would want to do so in a way that is really respectful to the culture, probably has a speculative edge to it, maybe as an alternate reality version of Japanese culture, and doesn't include actually any specific Japanese people in the game. Corey says he's joining late because his cat jumped off the back of the toilet as I was lifting the lid, and she knocked my phone out of my hand into the toilet. Or do I want another cat? Oh, Corey, that's a brutal way to, uh, to start the day. I'm sorry about that. I have my hands full with my two cats. Walter woke me up at uh, around 6.15 this morning, just yelling and yelling and yelling, um, and really just wanted to show me his food and, and go to the bathroom too, but it's a little earlier than I'd prefer to wake up. Michael says, uh, Jamie and the Secret Cabal had a lot of nice things to say about you today on the designer-centric episode they put out about all your games. It was great to hear. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. Yeah, I haven't actually listened to it. I, I think I'll, I'm a little too nervous to listen to such an episode about me, but, um, but I'm honored that, that the, the guys at the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast chose to highlight me as a designer on today's podcast. So, uh, yeah. And Michael, just to let you know, I spell my name. I'm glad you spelled it this way. I spell my name J-A-M-E-Y. Jamie on the Secret Cabal spells it J-A-M-I-E. Um, but we know who you're talking about. Carol popped in to say happy Wednesday. Hey, Carol, I hope you're doing well. William says, I love seeing that there are distinct meeples in Expeditions. Based on the rulebook and the Watch It Play video, there seem to be a lot of little touches of love in the game. Can't wait for July, August. There's, there, yeah, there, there's a lot of love in the game for me, from Jakob, for everyone who put their time into it, including you, William, who got to play test the game. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the final version when you get to play it. Uh, a few, I'll, I'll jump to, over to a few smart topics before I get to the, the other comments. One, I wanted to mention that Libertalia's uh, one year anniversary, one year retail release anniversary is coming up on Saturday. So if you have a copy of Libertalia, feel free to, to plan ahead for a game this weekend to celebrate the one year anniversary of Libertalia Winds of Galecrest. That's coming up this Saturday. Um, some recent videos I filmed were uh, this past video, past weekend. The video that I posted on Sunday was a chat that I had with Elizabeth Hargrave, a retrospective chat on Wingspan and the Wingspan expansions, and maybe a little bit about the future, but mostly about the past. I was very appreciate, very grateful for Elizabeth for joining me for that chat. It was a great chat about game design for the most part in in the Wingspan construct, Wingspan world. I mentioned that, that on Earth Day, Megan and I played Earth, and she crushed me at the game Earth. Um, so that's my third, no, fourth play, because I played on Board Game Arena the other day. And I will say, it's a really, really good Board Game Arena implementation, Earth. But it is a game that I actually think plays smoother on the tabletop. Uh, any game, I think, looks better on the tabletop. But as, as good as the impl implementation is on Board Game Arena, it's one of the games that where if you are playing it on Board Game Arena and you enjoy it, I think you're going to enjoy it even more on the tabletop. I would still recommend getting the tabletop version. Uh, play and win. I, the other day I sent out, every month I have a day where I send out play and win games to various conventions who have play and win sections. Play and win is when you go to a convention and they, have, they let you check out a game, play the game, often learn and play the game, and write down your name on a little card associated with that game. And at the end of the convention, they draw one card out of the hat or out of a virtual hat and someone who played the game gets to win. It's a win-win-win for conventions, players, and publishers, and so it's something that I always like to contribute to as part of our marketing efforts. So I sent out games for that the other day. Also, uh, we are getting very close to receiving the advanced review copies of Expedition, so I've been coordinating which reviewers will receive the, uh, the advanced copy. So I have that lined up so far. I've been working on that earlier this week. Blog post that I did recently, did a blog post about, uh, just on Monday, about which versions of a game to send to reviewers. Should, should publishers, I wasn't saying should publishers do this, but I was saying our policy at Summer Games is that we typically only send the standard versions of games to reviewers because we don't want people to be confused 
about uh, when they open their game, if they see a reviewer talking about a game that has like metal coins and they open their copy of the game and it doesn't have those metal coins, they might be a little frustrated or confused. And I think it's, I think reviewers generally do a pretty good job of indicating when a game is deluxe or if a component they're talking about is deluxe. But people watch videos in different ways and at different times. And sometimes they don't look at the title. They maybe don't listen to it. They're watching it, but not actually hearing the audio. And uh, I think the more reviewers can do to make it super, super clear when they're talking about a deluxe component, the more clarity they're offering to their audience. And so for that reason, we very rarely send the deluxe versions of games if we have a deluxe version or deluxe accessory um, so that there is no confusion on the end of the, con of the consumer. Also did a post uh, last Thursday about how to help uh, when you're several layers removed from an independent contractor, how to help them solve problems in intuitive ways, or at least highlight and identify problems that just don't make sense. I had a great discussion about this on last week's live cast that directly contributed to that, uh, that blog post. And, oh yeah, one big update here. I gotta highlight this, then I'll get back to the comments. But for the ironclad version of Expeditions in the US, we have now sold through all of the first wave copies of the ironclad version so those copies are wrapping up production now but there is a finite number to those copies we are making more because we during a pre-order here we knew we needed to make more and we already started making more a few months ago but uh if you now go and pre-order the ironclad version of expeditions from the u.s web store it's still fine we still have quantities in canada australia and in europe but in the u.s web store then that ironclad version that you're ordering will come a little bit later than the first wave. First wave is still set to deliver in July. The second wave will deliver probably in late August, early September. So just want to let you know that it is still coming. It is still in the works, but uh, it will take a little bit longer. Let's see. George says in PAX Premier Second Edition, there are three cards for dominant for the dominance check where they pop up from the deck and activate income. And based on some conditions, if they are met or not, players are scoring in one out of two possible ways. So George is talking about other ways to use that card row to do even other things too, not just signal, hey, we need to refresh these cards right now. You could do that, um, but also to have have them trigger something else unexpected or fun in the game. Ray says, so about my question about unfair advantages and how to leverage them to uh, to your benefit and to other people's benefit too. Ray says, I think mine would be that I can learn things quickly. I usually do well the first time I learn a new game, process at work, or instructions for a new appliance. I get to spend less time learning and more time doing, which is really nice. That's awesome, Ray. I appreciate you sharing that. And I love this. I, I hope people feel comfortable sharing their unfair advantages. And I, as Ray demonstrates here, it doesn't have to be something in any way that compares Ray to other people. Ray's just saying, hey, I'm good at this. And so I found that this is helpful for me and other people um, when I'm when I'm trying something for the first time. Carol says, says, does it feel odd being the only Stonemaier employee in St. Louis this week? The booth picture from Gamma on Discord looked great. Yeah, it was fun to see Joe and Alex and Dave and Susanna together at the same table um, over in Gamma in Reno. And I'm the only one left here in St. Louis. Although my coworker and co-founder, Alan, is still here in St. Louis as well. In fact, Alan's birthday was this week. Um, so it, it, I'm forever grateful for Alan for joining me for Viticulture and the founding of Stillmire Games. Alan is still involved with Stillmire Games with, uh, with our healthcare. He's in charge of our healthcare and he's also in charge of submissions. He also helps out with playtesting. So, but he, he's been there from, from the beginning. He's an amazing guy, amazing friend. I'm really grateful for him and happy birthday to him this week. Dusty says, I guess we conclude, conclude based on the inclusion of Walter and Biddy in Expeditions and others that you don't expect they'll commit any atrocities. Probably a safe call. I hope not. <laughs> I certainly hope not. And Carol says they're cats. So they could, it could still be risky. Kevin is popping in to say hi. Mark says, just finished an online game of Blood on the Clock Tower. How is everyone's day so far? Mark, that's a very late game for you, isn't it? Very early in the morning for you right now. Um, but I, I saw that Blood on the Clock Tower got nominated for Golden Geek Award. One of my favorite podcasts, Jake is joining us here. Decision Space got nominated for Golden Geek. Good luck to Jake in the, the voting that ensues from here. And I think a few of our games got nominated as well. It's not something that I talk about, uh, but if it happens, it happens. Libertalia got nominated and Wingspan Asia got nominated, I believe, are the two. Corey says, people still have an option to go to Geekway by volunteering through Double Exposure's Envoy program. Got an email from Vinny today that he's linking to below where, so if you 
are a little bit late hearing about Geekway to the West, the convention that happens in a little less than a month now, coming up in a few weeks, but you still want to attend and you can get into it through, uh, through the Double Exposure program. Devin says he's been thinking heavily about growing our community at Open Owl Studios. So Devin, uh, Devin, so this is actually pretty big news. Open Owl, Devin, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I just saw the announcement yesterday that out of our mind studios, Oom Studios, I believe you've either changed the name to Open Owl or you started a new imprint within Open Owl. So I couldn't entirely tell from the announcement, but either way, congratulations, Devin. That's awesome. And Devin says, what is the single most effective thing you have done to grow your Stomeyer community? I think the single most effective thing that I've done, oh, well, it's hard, hard to pick just one, Devin, because I think, and I'll explain this in a second and briefly. I think the biggest thing that I've done is to use our resources at Stomeyer Games to add value to other people through content creation, through the YouTube channel, through hopefully Instagram, through the blog post. So it is a... Uh, 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 content that, that adds value to people, creating that type of content that isn't focused only on what we're creating and kind of broadcasting, hey, this is the thing that we're making, come support us, but rather saying, this is how we want to support you by putting this content out here um, that is hopefully useful to you. However, the second part of that, and that's why I have to mention too, is that if you, even if you do that really, really well, someone does that really, really well, but they don't give people a way to actually follow along through an e-newsletter or a Facebook page or Instagram, things like that, ways to follow what you were actually doing, um, then it doesn't work because people don't have a way to find out when you actually do have something important about your company to share. So Devin, you already know all this, I think, but uh, the pairing of those two of having giving people a way to follow along and giving them content that they can gain value from beyond just knowing what's going on at your company, I think those two pair together well and ha have been, I think, the number one way for the Stomire Games community to grow over the years. Discord too. Discord is a more recent one for us. Greg says, if you're catching Star Trek TNG, uh, The Next Generation, by episode recommendations, and I am, may I suggest The Inner Light, Season 5, Episode 5. Let me add this to my list here. Season 5, Episode 5. This episode won a Hugo and is counted as both a fan and cast favorite. It's one that I may have already watched, but let me see if I haven't. I actually do have it on my list. I haven't watched it yet, but it's on my list. Of episodes. So the ones that I have, I'll mention the ones that I have that I haven't watched from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation that people have recommended. Um, I'll do it in order here. Season 3, Episode 15. Season 4, Episode 18. Season 5, Episode 2. Season 5, Episode 25, the one that you just recommended. And Season 6, Episode 18. Those are the ones I have on my list right now. Carol says that she's looking forward to a small charity-based game convention this weekend. That's awesome, Carol. Uh, there's usually one or two Stomar games in their play and win system. That's a great system. Uh, if they, yeah, if they filled out our form, there's almost a guarantee that, that we sent them something. Yeah, I think it's, it's very rare that I don't send out a game if someone asks for it on our, on our Google Doc. That's the best way to ask for it. Zach says, do you get excited about the Garp Hill Games live streams where they talk about their future releases? Would you say the games that they have been releasing recently are heavier than your current taste or just right? Maybe slightly heavier, but uh, I still love seeing what they create. They, they just create cool things. Uh, Garfil, I need to say that right. Garfil. I always say Garfil. Garfil Games. Uh, I do get excited about their live streams. I wasn't able to catch this one live, and I honestly, I need to go catch up on it. I did hear from Garrett yesterday that, um, that they are re-releasing uh, Shipwrights. Re completely redesigning it. Um, which I think is uh, takes a lot of humility for them to say, you know, um, this older game of ours no longer fits into what we were creating. So yeah, I need to go back and watch this live stream. Revisiting the North Sea, new ancient anthology game, upcoming game from Arcus and Inventors Sneak Peek. Pretty cool. Yeah, I really like that they do this. Sam and Shem just talk for an hour about what they're, what's coming up from them. That's awesome. A lot of people follow along with it too. Well, nearly 9,000 views. Yeah, it's a fun way to do it. Um, and really, I should highlight this thing. I, I like this method of having just them sitting down and talking to people for a, a while about what's coming up. I think that's a really neat way to, to share what the future holds. Um, I'm trying to think how that can apply to Stillmire Games. I'm always thinking about how, how we can do that too, how we can learn from what Garfield's doing. Because the way that I do announcements is usually through the e-newsletter. 
and then I hop on live here so you get to see me talk about it, which is a little similar to what they're doing, but Garfield only has a few of these announcements every year. Maybe they only do one a year, in fact. Um, and it's kind of they make a big deal of it, about it. Well, none of these live casts, no particular live cast is a big deal live cast because I do it every Wednesday. Um, yeah, so let me think about that. I'm glad you brought that up. I need to, I need to think a little bit more on, on how maybe I can do that better too. Carol says that Viticulture World was also nominated for an expansion for Golden Geeks. That's awesome. Thank you, Carol, for sharing that. Devin says, uh, yes, okay, so Out of Our Mind Games, Oom um Games, is still part of the company, but Open Al will be focused on the world-building campaign games. I see, okay, so world-building campaign games will now be delineated a little bit from other games uh, that Oom um makes. Uh, he says, it will be the head of the studio with Open Al, and Oom um will be other entities and development of other licensed games and develop, develop properties. That's awesome. Thank you, De Devin, for sharing that and explaining that. And congratulations as well. I hope you all are having fun over there at, uh, at Open Al Studios and Out of Our Mind Games. I'm really looking forward to um, uh, Mythwind. Mythwind is the game that I've backed that I'm really curious to see what, what that looks like uh, when it comes out. So... Keep, keep making awesome things over there at Open Owl and or Out of Our Mind Games. Carl says he's looking forward to the next few days of playing Dice Throne today and tomorrow, King of Tokyo on Friday, and then he'll be at Madness Comics this weekend playing Power Rangers, DBG, and, and Wingspan, among others. Sounds like some, some great gaming coming up for you, Carl. I'm hosting Game Night tonight. I have no idea what we'll play tonight. I'm actually kind of hoping for some Wingspan. i I'll, I'll let people decide. I'm the, I'm the host, so I'll let people decide what they want to play. But if they're up for some wingspan, I might be in the mood to play that tonight. We were talking about maybe, maybe play, playing that on Earth Day weekend, but we played Earth instead. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't mind playing that. Mark says, will there be another two promo realms for Rolling Realms released alongside the Expeditions promo realm following the three-at-a-time pattern release so far? So Mark, the pattern actually that we're trying to establish is that when we have a new game come out, we'll release the promo for that new game, but just that one. And then um, every few months, we'll release three promo packs all at once that are unrelated to still our game. So Expeditions will just have that one coming out with it. But uh, we do, we will have, prior to that, I, th I believe, prior to Expeditions, we'll have another round of three new promo realms that come out. So uh, I'm not going to say the exact timing yet or what they are, but we do have a plan for that. But I think that that is the pattern that you'll see in the future. New still our game, one new promo realm along with that game that you can mix in with all the other packs that you have. Yeah. So yeah, I think I've covered all the topics today that, that I meant to cover. Uh, those are all the things going on here. Thank you for your thoughts on Card Rivers. It was fun to discuss card markets and card rivers. And um, thank you for your thoughts on unfair advantages. I, I look forward to, to maybe discussing that on a blog post tomorrow. I'm going to head over and make some lunch. I'm going to make some yoki for lunch today. And uh, yeah, so I hope you have a, a good lunch, a good treat for yourself today. If you're in St. Louis, grab some cacao chocolate. That's what I'm munching on today for fun. And I will see you next Wednesday for some, some fun personal news next Wednesday, I think. I, I will have that to share for you. All right, Mark, George, enjoy your game nights and everyone else who's playing some games tonight. Have a great day and I will see you next Wednesday. Take care. Bye.